Hello, it's Caroline Brown from the University Archives again and in this film I'm going to talk to you about the lives of four women that are recorded in the University Archives. The four women I'm going to speak about were all born around the beginning of the 20th century. They all have connections with Dundee and they all appear in the archive collections. So on the right we have Margaret Fairley, in the middle we have Ruth Young and on the left is Margaret Cox and Mary Brooksbank. Now, if you listen to my last talk, you'll know a little bit about Margaret Fairley. She was born in 1891 in Angus and she studied medicine at St Andrews University and University College Dundee between 1910 and 1915. And as you may know, she was a prominent gynaecologist and she went on to become the first female professor in Scotland. The year before Margaret matriculated, so in 1909, Another of our women, Ruth Young, was graduating again in medicine and again from University College Dundee. She had been born in 1884. She was the daughter of a flax merchant and she had a remarkable career. She worked in women's medicine and specialised in maternity and child welfare. She was based mainly in India, but she travelled around the world. And while Margaret Fairley was studying in Dundee, she was already lecturing at the Women's Christian Medical College in the Punjab. And in 1916, she actually became a professor of surgery. When there were no women professors of surgery in Scotland, she was a professor of surgery at Lady Harding Medical College in Delhi. Now, back in Dundee, again, just as Margaret Fairley was matriculating, our third woman was beginning a life working in the city mills. So a very different life. This is Mary Brooksbank and she's perhaps the best known of our four women because of her songs about Dundee. She was born in Aberdeen in 1897 to a poor family and the family moved to Dundee a couple of years later. And by the age of 13 she was working in the mills. She came from a family with a strong trade union links and I think she inherited her father's campaigning spirit uh, she joined her first march de uh, demanding an increase in workers' pay when she was 14 and these are some of press cuttings detailing the strikes that are happening in Dundee at that time in 1911. Mary joined the Communist Party in 1920 and was an active member. She took part in many campaigns and represented the unemployed at labour tribunals. And she would have strongly supported the demonstrations that happened um, following the mass lockout of Duke workers in 1923 and the strikes of that time. And people have said that uh, at least 50,000 workers demonstrated in Albert Square in Dundee in 1923. And this was in response to potential job cuts at Cox's Brothers factory in Lockheed. Um, they were proposing introducing new machinery which would have meant fewer employees. This is the factory. Um, this is Camperdown Works in Lockie, and the chairman of Cox Brothers at that time was James Ernest Cox, who owned this factory, which has at one time been the largest textile factory in the world. And this is where our fourth woman comes in. This is Margot Cox. This is James's oldest child. Um, she was born in 1905 to an extremely wealthy family and as you can imagine her childhood was completely different to that of Mary Brooksbank. This is her on the right hand side in 1910. While Mary was working in, in the mills in her teens, uh, Margaret was attending Bentley Priory, a boarding school just outside London and here are some photographs from her time there. And when she returned to Scotland, she lived with her family at Methven Castle, pictured here. And in 1923, the year of that lockout, she was a debutant at the Perth Hunt Ball. And here she is with her mother, being reported by the local newspaper as attending a hunt meeting in that same year in 1923. By this time, Ruth Young had married but she was still in India and she was doing voluntary work in maternity and child welfare. And in 1925, she became personal assistant to the chief medical officer in the Women's Medical Service of India. She was awarded an MBE in 1928 for all of her achievements. And the following year, she published a volume, The Work of Medical Women in India. 
Meanwhile, Margaret Fairley was still teaching at the medical school at the University College Dundee, and in the mid-1920s, she joined Dundee Royal Infirmary, seen here, where she pioneered the clinical use of radium. And uh, she rapidly became well-known and was a recognised expert. The 1930s saw these four remarkable women continuing their different paths. Mary Brooksbank campaigned against the means test and in 1931, while speaking at a National Unemployed Workers Rally, um, she was arrested and charged with rioting. She was actually imprisoned three times during her life. Uh, Mary formed a branch of the Working Women's Guild. She also stood for election to Dundee Council, although she was never actually elected. But throughout her life, she continued protesting about poor working conditions for people. And this is a, a newspaper cutting from 1938, when she was campaigning to raise funds for Yorkshire textile workers. Um, she left the uh, Communist Party in 1933, but she, she continued to be quite militant and um, she was mainly drawn to Scottish nationalism after that. So while Mary was being arrested for writing in 1931, Ruth, Ruth Young was settling into her new role as the Director of the Maternity and Child Welfare Bureau of the Indian Red Cross Society. And in 1934, she undertook the first of a number of trips abroad, examining public health and maternity welfare and child welfare, um, performing training and um, taking surveys um, on behalf of the Rockefeller Institute in a number of countries in the Far East, Canada and the United States. And we're lucky enough to have her journals in the university archives. And here's an image uh, from her trip to the Far East and um, you can see she was very detailed in uh, what she recorded about her trips and her visits. In the meantime, Margaret Fairley continued to advance her career. She became, in 1936, head of Dundee Royal Infirmary's Department of Obstetrics and Gynaecology. And as we saw last time, this post usually came with a chair, but because Margaret Fairley was a woman, there was a reluctance to appoint her to this. And it wasn't until 1940 that she was finally appointed as professor, and that was the first woman professor in Scotland. Of course, by 1940, the Second World War was well underway. Margot Cox in Methven Castle um, was focusing her activities on supporting the Red Cross. And later in the war, she worked in a convalescent home for wounded soldiers in La Selva in Italy. And here she is, and this is from one of her journals. Just like Ruth Young, she kept uh, copious diaries and journals. And her diaries show a fascinating insight into her life, this mixture of, of real issues that she had to face during the war, but also what it was like day to day. Um, so this excerpt, for example, talks about she how she spent most of the afternoon trying to arrange transport for half a dozen officers. So those would have been the wounded or the convalescent officers. And then a little bit later on, she sat in the Italian sun behind the villa and had some tea. And later on after that, she watched quite a good cinema, let's face it, with Bob Hope. And Margot as well did um, some really good work that was recognised with an award uh, of an MBE, just like um, Ruth Young, for her work in 1942. So going back to 1940, that same year that Margaret Fairley was appointed professor, Ruth Young left her position as principal of Lady Harding Medical College as she had become in 1936. Um, she briefly went back to the UK and then decided to travel back to India. Uh, so this was in 1940, so this was when the war um, had started. And she was um, travelling on the sea and she kept this diary, which tells us what, that while she was travelling, um, there are many notices up about not encouraging uh, spreading rumours. And so far, people seem to be heeding them. A lady at our table opines that we will not be escorted at all, so that's escorted by boats, because this is a very old boat and the company doesn't mind if it's torpedoed. 
but luckily she made it. She made it back to India and she continued her good work. She was in fact awarded a CBE in 1941 and in 1943, so while the war was still going on, she travelled to Ethiopia to survey health conditions of women and children for the Ethiopian Women Work Association. And I just can't imagine how, how difficult that would be to, to be travelling to these places at that time. Um, and she didn't stop there. In 1945, um, she undertook a lecture tour of the Middle East on behalf of the British Council. And again, these are extracts from her journals. So going back to Mary Brooksbank, um, well, she spent the war um, in Tayport and, uh, and around Dundee. Uh, she was still living with her husband, Ernest, but Ernest was in ill health. And she remembered that in 1943, um, they were so poor that she was reduced to singing on the streets of Tayport to earn some money during his final illness. And it's only then, and particularly after she gave up waged work in 1948, that she began writing the poetry and the songs for which she is best remembered. She wrote about working conditions, she wrote about Dundee, she wrote about women, she worked about what it was like wrote about what it was like in the, the mills and her songs have been recorded by a number of artists. A lot of people in Dundee will recognise them and we're lucky enough to hold the manuscript versions of her songs in the university archives. Uh, this is perhaps her most famous song, it's Oh Dear Me or the Jute Mill Song and the ly lyrics were in fact added it to the wall of the Scottish Parliament um, so you can see them there. She was the first woman and in fact the first communist um, to be awarded this honour. Now you can hear Mary Brooksbank uh, voice and some of her poems and interviews with her on this website, the Kiss to Riches website. And I'm just going to sh uh, share with you a clip from that website and that project uh, funded by the University of Edinburgh and here is Mary uh, singing the Jute Mill song. Oh, dear me, the mouse can fast, the bear we shift, can we get a rest? Shift and bother, cross and fly, the bear we mark your work. So that's just the first verse, um, but more of it is on the website. So Mary continues to inspire new generations, and recently the designer Nicholas Daly, who had a show at the V&A um, in Dundee, featured one of her one of our manuscript notebooks um, at his show. Um, and you may well have seen it there, and here's just an image from it. So that's just a snapshot of the lives of these women. Mary and Margaret and Margot all lived until their late 70s and early 80s, and in fact Ruth died just short of her 100th birthday. Um, we've seen that uh, Mary at least is well remembered, and Margaret has a plaque on Discovery Walk in Dundee, but for me it's important to remember all of these women, to remember Margot and Ruth as well. Um, we're just so lucky that we have the University Archives that can tell us a little bit about their lives and that I've been able to share with you some of their remarkable stories. And if you want to find out more, when we're open you're welcome to come and look at the records to read those diaries from Margot and from Ruth and to find out a little bit more about Mary and Margaret. So thanks for listening and goodbye.